Good evening. Tonight's lecture will be covering chemical reactions and balancing equations. We'll be focusing on the law of conservation of matter as a means to balance our chemical equations, and then we will focus on the evidence that a chemical reaction has taken place. We will learn two different methods for balancing equations, which you can use during class. Let's take a moment to review the information learned in our last class. If you recall, we have chemical reactions, which are just simply another name for a chemical change. And there were a few different evidences of a chemical reaction taking place. We had the production of heat and or light, but remember heat by itself is not a guarantee of a chemical reaction that could also be involved in a phase change. We had the production of a precipitate or the formation of a precipitate where we had a solid forming from two clear liquids. We had the production of a gas that would take place. And then finally, we had color changes that could take place, excluding again, changes that are just based off of pH with an indicator. So when we look at our chemical equations, that is just simply a uh, way that chemists can represent chemical reactions that are taking place on paper. If you recall, the original material that we are starting with are called the reactants. They are always found on the left side of the chemical reaction, and then the products are the materials that are formed during the reaction, and they're always found on the right side. You can separate the individual reactants or products using a plus sign, and the arrow that's in the middle is what we call a yield sign, or produces a number of different terms that can be representing that, but that is basically showing us how the reaction is moving from the reactants into the products. All of our chemical reactions will follow the law of conservation of matter, which simply states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It simply changes forms. So how do chemical reactions follow the law of conservation of mass? It's pretty simple. If you remember from our mole unit, we said that even if we had just one gram of a substance, we had trillions upon trillions of atoms or molecules within that one gram. So all we're trying to do with the balanced chemical equations is we're trying to get the right ratio of the molecules or the atoms to react to produce the new compounds. Balancing is done by changing the coefficients, not the subscripts. If you remember, when we look at the subscripts for those chemical compounds, that is unique to that particular compound. So if I were to change the number of atoms within that compound, it would not be that compound any longer. So again, H2O is not going to be the same as H2O2. So when we look at this, we're just simply trying to multiply the number of molecules to get the correct ratios. As we look at the example down below, you'll notice that we have CH4 plus 2O2 forms CO2 plus 2H2O. On the product side, Initially, we had one carbon and four hydrogens and two oxygen atoms. On the product side, we had one carbon, two oxygens, plus two hydrogens and one oxygen. The number of hydrogens was not the same from reactants to products. So in order to get the hydrogens to be the same, I have a second unit of water that was created. That now gives me four hydrogens and two oxygens to go along with the one carbon and the two oxygens. So that now brings me up to a total of four oxygens. And then because there were only two oxygens initially on the reactant side, we added a second molecule of O2 in order to balance out the oxygens. So again, you're always just trying to balance it by using the coefficient. That's the number that goes out in front and it multiplies everything to the right of it in that particular compound. So let's look at why we change the coefficients instead of changing the subscripts in order to balance a chemical equation. When we're changing the coefficients, we're keeping the same substance, we're just changing the number of molecules or atoms of that particular substance that we have. That way we can have the correct number of atoms of each element on both sides of the equation. If we change the subscripts, we're now going to be changing the chemical identity and the properties of that particular substance and so it will no longer be the same chemical reaction. An example of this would be hydrogen and oxygen, which can make water or hydrogen peroxide. You can see with the formation of the water, you have a ratio of two to one 
for the hydrogen molecules to the oxygen to produce two units of water, whereas for the hydrogen peroxide, you have one unit each of H2 and O2 to produce one unit of the hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide can be lethal if you drink it, whereas water is completely safe. The following is a list of symbols that can be used in a chemical reaction. The first one you have the solid, liquid, and gas, which are your normal three states of matter. We have the aqueous, which is the AQ, which just means that that substance has been dissolved in water. So typically this can be ionic compounds or polar covalent compounds. You can have a down arrow if you'd rather not use the solid. You can show that you have a down arrow to represent the fact that you have a solid precipitate forming or you could have a arrow pointing up to represent the fact that you have a gaseous product that has formed. You would put those after the substance that would be produced. So if you had carbon dioxide being produced as an example, we would write CO2 and then you could have it as the up arrow or you could list it as CO2 with just a gas G in parentheses. For your reactions, again, you have the arrow that would represent the fact that something is being produced as a result of the reaction. Again, the single-sided arrow, this means that this reaction is complete. And the double-sided arrow, that is going to be talking about a reaction where we have a mixture of reactants and products found at the end result for that chemical reaction. So this is something that we would call an equilibrium system. When you place a triangle above the arrow or heat, that is just telling us that the reaction is endothermic and that it requires heat in order to make the reaction take place. If you see something like this next one where you have 1.0 times 10 to the 8th kilopascals, that is just representing the fact that this reaction had to take place under a certain pressure or you could have a degree Celsius sign that it was carried out at a specific temperature. We have the last part here where you could either do a substance or you could just simply write catalyst above the arrow to represent the fact that you had this reaction catalyzed. And then finally, you could have a E negative to represent that it is being done by electrolysis. So essentially with the electrolysis is that you are supplying energy in order to break apart the reactants. So you're making the reaction take place by applying electricity. Okay, so let's start by going through a few examples here to set up your chemical reactions. Now, I realize that a lot of you can probably for a lot of these reactions just simply look at them and figure out how many atoms on each side but we do have more difficult problems so I want to give you guys a little bit better more reliable method that you can use to solve these problems so when you're doing that the first thing that I would recommend doing is setting up a data table where you just simply have your reactants found on one side of the equation and your products on the other every time that you see either a sorry there's no arrows in here um, anytime that you see a plus sign or an arrow, just draw a line down to separate the different substances. That way, when you multiply everything for a coefficient, it's multiplying everything in the column. So when I set this up, I would say that I have one carbon and I have four hydrogens. I have two bromines. I have one carbon and now four bromines. And then I have one hydrogen and one bromine. You'll notice in this reaction as well, I have multiple compounds that contain bromine in the products. So anytime that you have a substance found in more than one compound, I would highly recommend waiting as long as you possibly can to balance that equation. So as I'm looking here, it's a good idea to typically start with the most complex molecule to try to do the balancing portion of this but it's not always going to be the case. So in this first example, you'll notice here that I have four atoms of hydrogen in the methane versus one atom of hydrogen with the, uh, the hydrogen bromide gas. So I'm gonna start by multiplying this reaction, or this by four, 
and that would give me four hydrogens and four bromines. Now my hydrogens balance, my carbons already balance, and then if you notice here on my product side, I have four plus four for a total of eight bromine atoms. And so as a result, I'm gonna multiply this by four as well to give me a total of eight. So anytime that we have a reaction where I only need to have one, you can leave it blank. You don't have to put a one in. It's just understood that those are ones and not any other numbers. The only thing that I would say is that if you have a reaction where you just have one, 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 and one, just simply write already balanced out to the side and that should suffice. So let's look at our second reaction now. So I have, again, my reactants over here. I have my product over here. So I'm going to draw out my separate substances. So I have one Fe. I have two atoms of oxygen. And then I have two atoms of iron and three atoms of oxygen. Again, for any compound, write all the elements out in a column. So now when I'm looking, I have two irons here versus one. I have two oxygens versus three. So in this case, because the iron is a one, I'm going to leave it till the end because it's probably going to change. So when I look and I see my oxygens, two is the reactants, three is the product. The lowest common multiple between two and three is six. So I'm going to multiply everything in the product by two and make that my coefficient. That would now give me four atoms of iron and six atoms of oxygen. And then for my oxygen on the reactant side, I'm gonna multiply that one by three. That gives me six atoms of oxygen. So now the one atom of iron versus the four atoms of iron, I'm gonna have four as my coefficient. And now everything balances out. As we move on to our next example, I have aluminum plus hydrochloric acid forming aluminum chloride plus hydrogen gas. So again, making my little data table here, separating my columns out, I have one atom of aluminum, I have one atom of hydrogen, one atom of chlorine, one atom of aluminum, and now three atoms of chlorine, and then finally two atoms of hydrogen. <laughs> So as I begin to work my way through this process here, again, I will notice that my aluminums, I have one atom each. I have two atoms of the hydrogen as a product versus one atom as a reactant, and then three and one. Now, in this case, it's gonna become a little bit trickier just because it's gonna change as we go through, and that's okay. So in those types of situations, I could start off and just simply say, I've got three atoms of chlorine versus one atom of chlorine. Again, starting with the most complex molecule. So if I multiply that by three, that'll give me three and three. So my chlorines would be fine. But now notice my hydrogens, I have three for one and two for the other. So I would have to multiply this again by two because the lowest common multiple is six between two and three. So I'd now have six, I would now have six here, and I would have six for my chlorines. That would now mess up my chlorines. I have three chlorine atoms on the product versus six. So I'm gonna multiply that by two. That'll give me two aluminums and six chlorines. And so I need to multiply my last aluminum as a reactant by two as well. So I'd have two, six, two, and three. For my coefficients. And now for our last problem. We have calcium carbonate plus hydrochloric acid forming calcium chloride plus carbon dioxide and water. So I'm going to do the same thing, set up my data tables every time I see a plus sign or the reaction arrow. So now I have one calcium, I have one carbon, and I have three oxygens. Now there are a lot of times if you have a polyatomic ion, found identically on both the reactants and the products, you can keep them together, but you'll notice that it's changing in this case from CO3 to just carbon dioxide CO2. Since it's not identical, I'm gonna split it up. So I now have one hydrogen, one chlorine. On the product side, one calcium, two chlorines, one carbon, 
two oxygen, two hydrogen, and one oxygen. So as we begin to work our way through this, again, starting with my most complex molecules, I have one CaCl2. And when I look at that, I have one calcium on the reactant side, and I have one on the product side. I have two chlorines on the product side versus one on the reactant side. So the first thing I'm going to do is multiply my hydrochloric acid by two. That gives me two hydrogens and two chlorines. At this point, I have two hydrogens and two hydrogens, so they're balanced. I have a total, if I add my oxygens together, I have two from the carbon dioxide plus one from the water for a total of three oxygens, and I have three oxygens present in the calcium carbonate. So we're actually all balanced using this reaction. So now let's look at a situation where we have a word problem that is given to us. So in this first example, we have solid mercury 2 sulfide decomposing into its component elements when heated. So as we begin to look at this problem, the best thing that you can do is just simply write out all of your ions that you have for these compounds. So in this case, just listing out my ions really quickly, mercury 2, remember that is Hg with a 2 plus charge. Notice that's not the polyatomic ion, that was mercury 1, where we had Hg2 with a 2 plus charge. So I have Hg with a 2 plus, I have S with a 2 minus. So again, if I do my cross drop and reduce, that gives me HgS as the chemical formula. It's decomposing into its component elements, so that means that it is going to break down into Hg and S. Now, sulfur has something that we call allotropes, um, where it can exist in different molecular forms. So it could be just as a single atom, or it could be found as S8. That's not something that I would expect you guys to know or predict for us, but just so we can actually balance the equation and not just have it one, one, and one, I'm gonna place the S8 allotrope for this particular problem. So in this case, setting up my reaction, Again, I've got my different parts here. Here's my products. Here's my reactants. So I'd have one mercury. And I would have one sulfur. On the product side, I'd have one mercury and eight sulfurs. So now to figure out my balance, again, I would start with the sulfurs. I have eight sulfurs versus one. So I would multiply the first reactant by eight. That'll give me eight mercuries, eight sulfurs. So I can multiply my mercury in the products by eight as well to balance the equation. Okay, so now when we do our next one here, aluminum metal combining with oxygen in the air. So in this case, when those two things combine, it's going to produce aluminum oxide. Okay, so I'd have Al, oxygen is what we call a diatomic element, so it is going to be found as O2. Again, any of our diatomic elements, I'll just write those off to the side over here because we haven't talked about that yet in class this year. So your diatomic elements, you have hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So if you just remember all these elements when they're found by themselves in nature, they're always going to be found as a pair. And if you just remember that these are always going to end in either I-N-E or G-E-N, it's an easy way to remember your diatomic elements. So as I go through this here, I now have for aluminum off your periodic table, I have a three plus charge. For the oxygen, I have a 2 minus. So my chemical formula will therefore be Al2O3 for the product. So making my data table once more, separate here and here. So I have one aluminum, I have two oxygens, two aluminums, and three oxygens. So again, three versus two. I'm going to multiply my number of aluminum oxide 
molecules or formula units by 2. So that now gives me 4 and 6. I'm going to multiply my number of oxygen molecules by 3, which would give me 6 atoms of oxygen. And then finally, because I have 4 versus 1, I'm going to multiply the original aluminum by 4. So a lot of times you can also be given a picture for a chemical reaction. And by looking at the picture, you can determine what the chemical reaction should be and what will be the products. So as we look at this here, it tells us that we have white spheres that are representing hydrogen atoms. And then we have blue spheres that are representing nitrogen atoms. Notice again, GEN, GEN. So when I write the nitrogen, that would be represented as N2, that is a gas, and then I would react that with H2, which is also a gas. So when these two things come together, they're going to form ammonia, which is NH3, and it is also a gas. You could call this nitrogen trihydride. It's just a common name that we use for it, which is ammonia. You guys should be familiar with that. It's the cleaning product that you would use. Uh, in your bathrooms or in your kitchens, but this would be your chemical reaction. So as you can see here, if I'm setting up my data table for this reaction, I would have two nitrogens, two hydrogens, one nitrogen, and one uh, three hydrogens. So as I'm looking through this again, I have three versus two for my hydrogens. I'm just going to multiply the first one by three. And then I'm going to multiply my second product there by 2. So that would now give me 2 and 6 and 6. So I now have my balanced chemical equation. So when we're looking at this ratio here, hopefully you can see I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 hydrogens. So I have 9 H2 molecules. I have 3 and two molecules. So now as a result of that, looking at my chemical reaction, that would tell me that I would be able to form six ammonia. Since I have three atoms, uh, three molecules of nitrogen, excuse me, that gives me a total of six atoms of nitrogen. So I would be able to form compounds with six different nitrogen atoms. And I'm just going to switch this over to yellow because of the white background there. So I'd have six different ammonia molecules that would form from this diagram. Okay, so take a moment to pause the video and try to balance this chemical reaction on your own. Okay, so now let's look at how we would go about solving this problem. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to list out all of my ions. And again, this will become more important as we go along, but magnesium off your periodic table is a plus two charge. The chloride is a minus one. Potassium is a one plus. And then the phosphate ion, if you recall, that is PO4 three minus. So now that I have all of my ions present, it makes it really easy to not mess up the skeleton equation, which is the unbalanced chemical equation. So in this case, because I have magnesium chloride, Mg2 plus, Cl minus, that would be MgCl2. And then that would be an aqueous substance. I would have potassium phosphate, K plus, PO4 three minus, that would be K3PO4, and that would be another aqueous reactant. And when these two things mix together, they're going to form magnesium phosphate. So again, Mg2 plus PO4 3 minus, that would give me Mg3 PO4 parentheses 2. And that would actually form a precipitate. Again, not expecting you to know this yet. And then we would have potassium chloride, K plus Cl minus. So I just simply have KCl, and this would also be aqueous.
or aqueous, excuse me. All right, so now let's go ahead and start the balancing process. So forming my reactants and my products. This is an example for what I was telling you guys earlier. Notice that I have PO4 found identically on each side of the reaction. So instead of breaking them up into individual phosphorus and oxygen atoms, I can just keep it together as an individual phosphate. So I'm going to set up my different columns here. So my first one, can I have one magnesium? I have two chlorines. I have three potassiums. And now I can just simply say that I have one phosphate because again, notice it's not in parentheses. So I have just one. And now on my product side, I have three for my magnesiums. And I have two because I have the parentheses with the two on the outside. I have two for the number of phosphates. And then finally, one potassium and one chlorine. So as I go through this problem, the next step in here for balancing, I wanna start with my most complex substance, which is the magnesium phosphate. So you can figure out which one is the most complex by just simply looking at which one has the greatest number of atoms in the molecule. So since I have three atoms of magnesium, in the magnesium phosphate versus only one atom of magnesium in the magnesium chloride, I'm gonna start by multiplying the magnesium chloride by three. So I have three and six. Now notice I have two phosphates in the magnesium phosphate versus one phosphate in potassium phosphate. So I'm gonna multiply this by two, and that will make my number of phosphates equal. And now finally, if you notice, I have six potassiums and six chlorines, and I have one each on the product. So I'm gonna multiply this by six. So I have three, two, one, and six for my coefficients. Okay, so let's try one more example problem here. And this one says that chromium compounds exhibit a variety of bright colors. When solid ammonium dichromate, NH42Cr2O7, a vivid orange compound is ignited, a spectacular reaction occurs as shown in the two photographs. The products are solid chromium three oxide, nitrogen gas, and water vapor. Balance the equation for this reaction. So again, let's set this up. So I have NH4 parentheses two, Cr2O7, and they tell us that is a solid and that decomposes. So I'm gonna place that here. Uh, since it's being ignited, we know that it's gonna use heat. So I'm gonna put a little triangle up above the reaction arrow. And now for my products, I have chromium three oxide. So again, Cr three plus O2 minus. So I know I'm gonna get Cr2 O3, nitrogen gas, which is N2. And then finally, water vapor. So I'd have H2O, and that would be a gas. This would be a gas, and this would be a solid. Okay. So as we begin the process here, I'm going to make my data table. And you will notice that the two polyatomic ions that I have on the reactant side, neither one of them are found together as a product. So I'm going to split everything up. Please remember when I have that subscript outside of the parentheses, that means that I'm multiplying everything inside by that number. So in this case, I would have two hydrogens, or nitrogens, excuse me, I'd have eight hydrogens, and then I would have two chromiums and seven oxygens. On my product side, I have two chromiums and three oxygens, two nitrogens, and then two hydrogens, and one oxygen. So for this particular reaction, you'll notice that my number of nitrogens are the same. My number of chromiums are the same as well. I have multiple oxygens found in the product side. So I'm gonna wait to balance the oxygens before I do anything else. And then finally, I have my hydrogens. I have eight hydrogens as a reactant. I have two as a product. So I'm gonna multiply my number of waters by four. And when I do that, that gives me eight and four. So my number of hydrogens are now the same, but notice for my oxygens, I have three plus four, 
which gives me a grand total of 7, which balances out over here. So my balance equation would just simply be 1 ammonium dichromate forming 1 chromium 3 oxide, 1 nitrogen gas, and 4 water vapors. Now for all my math geeks out there, I'm going to show you guys an algebraic method for balancing your equations. This is a little bit trickier, but it can be a lot faster once everything gets figured out. So I would recommend doing a few of these problems using this algebraic method to make sure that you understand the concept of it before you try to apply it on a more regular basis. So the thing that you want to do once you have your chemical reaction set up, you simply want to use some variables instead of coefficients to represent your balanced equation. So you can choose whatever letters you want. I'm going to use A, B, C, and D. You can use W, X, Y, Z if you want. I would just not recommend using M, N, O, and P just because the O will look like a zero. So as you go through this process, the next part of it is to just simply assign the uh, letters for the chemical reaction based on the number of atoms that are found in that particular compound. So I'm going to start off with the calcium and the calcium carbonate. Again, for this, I have one atom of calcium. So for the calcium, I'm just going to say that I have A because I only have one atom of calcium and I find calcium on the product side. It's on the C variable and you'll notice that I have three atoms of calcium. So I'm going to set this equal to 3 times C. When I look at carbon next, I have only one atom of carbon again in the compound calcium carbonate for the A. So I'm going to set this equal to A. And then where I have carbon as a product, it's in the D molecule. And you'll notice I have only one atom of carbon there as well. So I can set A and D equal to each other. So that means for me, whatever my coefficient for A is, I'm going to have that same exact coefficient for D. So now when I go on and I look at oxygen, this one, again, oxygen is the last element that you want to try to balance normally. And you can see why here, because if you notice, I've got oxygen in all four compounds. So for my reactants, I would have 3 times A plus 4 times B equals 2 times 4, because I have two phosphates. So I'd have 8C and then 3D. For my phosphorus, in the first compound, I have just 1 in B. And in the second compound, I have 2 for C. And then finally, for my hydrogens, I have 3 for B. And I have 2 for D. So now, as I set this up, it's pretty simple. So now all I need to do is I'm going to arbitrarily set C to equal 1. I'm doing that because it's my most complex molecule. It might not always work out that way, but if it has a coefficient, when you do all the numbers, you would get a fraction for some of the others. So you'd know what to multiply everything by to keep the ratio the same. So I'm going to set C equal to 1 as my beginning point. So now, looking at my relationships, I know that 1A is equal to 3 C's. So therefore, I know my A would have to equal 3. Because from the C, I know that my A and D are identical to each other. I know that my D is also equal to 3. And lastly, knowing that B is equal to 2 times C, I know that since C is 1, my B would equal 2. You could also do it based off of the hydrogens. Knowing that D is 3 and I have 2 times 3, that would give me a total of 6. That would be equal to 3 times B. 6 divided by 3 equals 2. So that would tell me that my chemical reaction would be 3 calcium carbonates plus 2 phosphoric acids forms 1 calcium phosphate and finally 3 carbonic acids. Okay, So you can do this 
either using the algebraic method or the traditional method. If you want to make a data table with it, you can just kind of see here, I've got one phosphate. If you want to do it by inspection, I've got one phosphate versus two. So I need to have a two for that coefficient. That gives me a total of six hydrogens versus two. So I know that my D would have to be three to give me six. And then I have one carbonate and one carbonate. So again, um, since I have, or I have three carbonates, I should say, due to the coefficient here. So I'd have three for the calcium carbonates. So again, one way or the other, uh, you can solve the problems the same way, but this algebraic method, when you get used to it a little bit, will definitely go a lot faster. All right, so I'm gonna do one last example here using this algebraic method, and we're gonna use the reaction between magnesium nitride and water to produce magnesium hydroxide and ammonia. So for this particular reaction, again, I'm going to list out my elements. So for magnesium, if I just say this is A, this is B, C, and D once again, I know that there are three A's, and that is equal to one C. And then I have for the nitrogen, I have two A's equals one D. For the hydrogen, I have two B's equals 2C plus 3D. And finally, for my oxygen, I have one of B equals two of C. So in this case, again, trying to find my most complex molecule here, I'm going to, in this case, set A equal to one. All right, so knowing this, three times A equals C. I know that I have three times one, so C would equal three. So when I come to the next one here, knowing that for the nitrogen, the two times A equals D. So again, two times one, that would equal two. And now for the B. I know that the B is equal to 2 times C. So in this case here, I would have 2 times 3, which would equal 6. So just so you can see that if we were writing it all out, I now have all of my equations. So I would have 1, 6, 3, and 2 for those coefficients. Let's just rework this problem using the little data table method so you can kind of see how everything all plays out. Okay, so we'll do MgOH2 and NH3. So if I were going to set up my data table here for these problems, I have magnesium with three, I have nitrogen with two, hydrogen with two, oxygen with one, I have magnesium with one, oxygen with two, hydrogen with two, and then finally nitrogen with one and hydrogen with three. So as I'm working my way through this problem, notice again I have two different hydrogens as my products. So I'm gonna wait as long as I can to balance the hydrogens and balance everything else first. So again, my most complex molecule is going to be the magnesium nitrate, or nitride, excuse me. So I have three magnesiums versus one magnesium. So I'm multiply that by three. That gives me three, six, and six. And I have two nitrogens versus one. It's gonna multiply my ammonias by two. That would give me two and six as well. So now for my oxygens, you'll notice I have six oxygens versus one, multiply that by six. So that would give me 12 and six. And lastly, again, 12 hydrogens here. I have two times three, which is six, plus three times two, which is also six. Six plus six gives me a total of 12 hydrogens. So everything is balanced out. So whether you like to use the 
algebraic method or whether you'd like to use the data table method completely up to you uh, but one way or the other uh, wouldn't be uh, bad if you learned how to do that algebraic method so that ends the lesson for today uh, you have some practice problems that you guys can be working on and uh, we'll do some practice tomorrow in class going over this stuff have a good evening